Brother, I'm Van. Welcome to the channel. You know what's weird? Christians are weird. Well, really, I believe that most religious individuals are weird and most religions are also weird. Typically, the older, the weirder. I was raised Southern Baptist and in my church, we went to church, we sat in a chair, we sang for a few minutes, listened to a guy talk, and then we left at exactly noon. If we didn't leave at exactly noon, people left at exactly noon anyway, you know? But then you have Episcopalian, you have Methodists, you have Quakers, you have Mormons, you have Jehovah's Witnesses. And in truth, you don't get much weirder than Catholicism. Catholicism is the quote-unquote original church of Christianity. It is the first practice, it is the one that has been around the longest, and the one that holds most of the world's secrets in their lives library that you're not allowed to go into under threat of death. They have books made of human skin in there, and I just want to know why. But Catholics, to me, really kind of exemplify the fact that Christianity is a death cult. True and true, 100%. Like, if we could do necromancy, Catholics would be the best at it. We would commune with the spirits, literally, and they would raise the dead to bolster their numbers or something. I, I don't know. It'd be very 40k, is what I'm saying. But what do I mean by death cult? What do I mean by... Catholicism in particular is a death cult. Well, first let's look of communion, or there's another term for it for Catholicism, and I don't, the Eucharist, where you take of bread and wine, it represents Jesus's flesh and blood. And depending on how deep you go in Catholicism, it becomes Jesus's flesh and blood, which you are partaking on. One of Jesus's primary miracles that occurred constantly in his presence was the raising of the dead. But also, too, Jesus himself was sent here to die, so his blood may wash us away. His death brings us salvation, which is very death culty. I mean, <laughs> but I think the place that this is best exemplified within the Catholic religion and within the Catholic faith are in artifacts. Artifacts are holy items that have either been in possession of a saint or directly related to Jesus in some way, shape, or form, like the, 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 the splinters of the cross or something. Those things would be considered first-tier artifacts as would the body parts and full dead bodies of saints that they keep inside of these big shiny boxes called reliquaries. We've already talked about one in a previous video, and that one's weird enough, but that's only scratching the surface. But instead of just listing these things and going, Ew, I'm instead going to kind of talk about the saint themselves as well. Because most of them did live interesting, varied, and really typically tragic lives, and it's... It's fun to read about, I'm gonna be honest. Remember to like this video, please subscribe. Subscribe, that's the main thing. I'm close to a thousand, and I took a pretty long sabbatical between this video and my last video. So I'm gonna try to hit a thousand by the end of the year. That's my goal now. So if you could help me get there, that'd be fantastic. That'd be great of you. I'd love you at least until the next video. Then you'd be old news. Also, viewer discretion is a little advised. Most of these are not what I would consider triggering, but dead things gonna be shown in this video. So to start, we're gonna we're gonna begin with the one that we've already covered, and that's the prepuce, the holy prepuce, the foreskin of Jesus Christ himself, supposedly. The holy prepuce can spray perfumed mists is associated with quite strong storms, and if you rub it against the eyes of a blinded man, or woman, presumably, uh, they are potentially cured of their blindness. So all you've got to do is rub this 2,000-year-old foreskin on your eyes and you can see again. That's it. That's, that's the price you pay. But keep in mind, with the Holy Prepuce, that 31 individual churches just in Europe have claimed ownership of it at some point in time. And some of those at the same time. So, odds are they're just rubbing some guy's foreskin on your eyelids, and he's not even the son of God, you know? The hair and fingernails of St. Clair. You may be thinking, that's not quite as weird as a foreskin, and you would be correct, but it is creepier. Also, there's gonna be a lot of Italian in this video, and I don't know Italian, so I'm just going based off of uh, what I think is correct, and I'm probably not right, so I apologize for that. St. Clair was born in Achichi, Achisi, Acai, to the Alfred Duccio house. She was well off, well to do, and then she was placed into an arranged marriage that she did not want a part of. She instead devoted her life solely to living for God and living, you know, for the poor and the impoverished. She literally lived in squalor for most of her life because she just 
loved God so much and wanted to live by his principles so much and definitely, definitely did not want to marry that guy. <laughs> she eventually kind of gathered something of a convent and really around the time she turned 18, because keep in mind, a lot of things happen to people, uh, a lot of things happen to most of these saints before they're even 20. Um, and in this case, she was young. She was, I believe, 12 or 13 and being arranged to wed a like 35 year old man or something like that whenever she turned 18 or 16 whatever the age of consent was back then instead of still marrying the man like he was originally intending and like her family was originally intending despite all of these things she cut her hair completely off that's pretty pretty much it um at one point she apparently defended the entirety of like her city, Achichi, Assisi. Apparently, once she defended her entire city of Asai from an invading force of just barbarians, I guess. I, I don't know. But she prayed at them real hard and they left. So, okay. Um, Blood of St. Januarius. And I kind of like the Blood of St. Januarius. I may do a another video, a shorter video, just on the Blood of St. Januarius. So, I'm going to keep this one a little brief. So, the Blood of St. Januarius is kept in a little reliquary which definitely does have blood in it and we can tell because it's been analyzed it's got hemoglobin in it and it is a clear vial however we're not allowed to open it because that would ruin the blood because there are mystical properties associated with the blood now apparently the blood of saint january the blood of saint january will undergo a process known as liquefaction roughly three times a year i say roughly it's supposed to be exactly three times a year but when it doesn't undergo that liquefaction, something bad's gonna happen. There's a long list of things that are associated with it, and again, I may go over it in another video, but just know that it's unreliable at best and typically only focuses on Rome. But nowadays, you can kind of just find something if you really look for it. You know, like, if you start really looking for a bad thing, and then you'll be like, oh, it didn't liquefy, there's that bad thing. Like, you can, you can just find connections. But St. Januarius himself, we don't really know much about either. He was one of the earliest saints canonized in the church. We do we do know he was the bishop of Naples by the age of 20, and he hid Christians for uh, the rest of his life at that point, mostly thanks to the presence of the Romans, who were still there. And Emperor Diocletians, who I probably mispronounced that, uh, found him and had him executed. That's, that, that's, that. We have nothing after that. Uh, the earliest mention of him we have found was in like 400 AD, so he's probably just made up. Next, we have the tongue and jaw of St. Anthony. Yes, we're getting into the slightly uh, more macabre ones now, if you can't tell. But St. Antonio. Antonio. St. Antonio. Antonio was a wealthy man. He was born into a wealthy family, which is a recurring trend amongst some of the saints. A good number of the saints, as a matter of fact. And apparently he performed some miracles in life, but uh, they're kind of weak. He prayed to fish at one point, like he went to the beach and was praying and nobody was listening to him. So then he went to the ocean, prayed in the ocean, like standing with his feet in the ocean. A bunch of fish apparently swam up and were listening to him. That's one of his miracles, by the way. Like that is top tier St. Anthony material. He was also poisoned at one point in his life and survived miraculously, apparently, which is pretty cool as well. But then he died of poisoning later in life um, by something that is now known as St. Anthony's fire. 30 years after his death, his body was exhumed, which is another thing that Catholics do with per like saints and priests all the time is they just remove, they dig their corpses up and pick them apart because in this case, his tongue and jaw were left, and they're in almost perfect condition for how long they've been there, supposedly. And now the Catholic Church just uh, kind of keeps them. They put them in a big shiny box and display them. Cool. That's first thing I want to see whenever I walk into my, you know, safe place is a is a, <laughs> a mummified jaw and tongue of a man who's been dead for uh, almost 2,000 years. It's real cool. It's real chill. St. Agatha's Breasts. Yes, I am serious. Supposedly, she was also from a rich, noble family, but most of her early life is just made up, like, objectively. Even the church typically accepts that her early life is legend. But at the age of 15, she rejected the advances of a Roman governor who was over her little, I guess, area. I say little. It was probably a pretty sizable area. This man was likely very powerful, he did what any normal, rational, reasonable person would do in this scenario, and uh, kidnapped her. Like a 
fucking crazy person. He tortured her in pretty much every way you can think of. Most of which I'm just not going to talk about because that is, a, it's a little gratuitous. And by a little gratuitous, I mean a lot gratuitous. The one that we need to keep in mind is that at one point, her breasts were ripped off with tongs. And yes, that's apparently a thing that people did back then. Later that same night that that supposedly happened, St. Peter came to her in jail in her prison cell and took her to heaven. And that is where St. Agatha's story ends. She was tortured to death and she died. On a slightly funnier note, though, when St. Peter showed up, some people believe that he healed her of her wounds. Like, he actually healed her of any of the harm that had come to her, including regrowing her breasts. However, she still died of her injuries. <laughs> now we have a more modern saint, actually, and that is Oliver Plunkett. Oliver Plunkett was born to a rich, noble family. Stop me if you've heard this before. And he was born during the period of the Irish Confederate Wars. And unfortunately for him, he was Irish during this time. Now, Oliver Plunkett did some studying in Rome to try to be the best Christian he could be. And when he returned, he tried to get the Irish clergy to stop drinking alcohol. Because of that, everyone hated him. Every single fucking person hated him. The British hated him because he was Irish, and the Irish hated him because he was trying to get them to stop drinking. There's a lot more to it than that. I'm very much oversimplifying. It's not quite that simple. History never is. But the trial that eventually came about him for whatever reason, I don't remember what it was, was incredibly politically motivated and biased to the point that whatever it was didn't really matter. They just wanted him dead. It was so biased and politically motivated by the church in particular that even King Charles II, who knew Oliver Plunkett had done nothing wrong, did not pardon this man, this man of a noble, rich family, even if he was Irish, you know? But Oliver was hung? No. But Oliver was hanged, drawn, quartered, and dismembered. He was apparently also disemboweled, and his head is now kept in a reliquary at a church, displayed proudly. Now, Oliver's head is the beginnings of what we're going to see in a little bit, which is called unincorruptible, meaning that it does not lose all of its features. For the most part, that just means mummified. It's just another word for mummification. But supposedly, with some of the ones we'll talk about later, they are incorruptible to the point of still being basically just like that person sleeping. Also of note, Oliver Plunkett didn't really perform any miracles in his life. No miracles happened to him. Um, he was just rich. And of course, he was the one that is probably in the most modern time frame. So it makes sense that we don't have any miracles because we haven't turned his life completely into legend yet. Give it about a thousand years. We'll have we'll have him doing something. We have the head of John the Baptist himself with the same asterisk as uh, Jesus's prepuce. See, St. John is probably the most important figure in all of Christianity, almost to the point of being more important than Jesus. John's birth, much like Jesus's, was also preordained and was also a miraculous birth. He was not immaculately conceived, but he was born to aged and barren parents who had never been able to conceive a child. Unlike many of the other preordained beings or godlike beings, John was quite literally the miracle himself. He did not perform any miracles of his own. He was the miracle in this case. So many things had to line up in order for John to even exist even more so than Jesus. John needed to be born so Jesus could be born. And about 2,000 other things needed to happen before John could be born. John, being a Christian and being one of the closest known associates of Jesus, was hanged. He was killed. Then he was beheaded and his head was buried separately from his body. Later, his head was exhumed and then it was reburied. Then it was exhumed again. Then it was reburied, supposedly. Then it was exhumed. You get the point. His head's moved a lot to the point that right now, four separate churches all claim to have the head of St. John the Baptist. One church in Damascus, one church in Rome, one church in France, and one church in Munich, all of which claim to have the head of John the Baptist. They do have a human head. They have a human head in a box, but three out of four of those are not John the Baptist, and one of them probably isn't John the Baptist. So they just have these heads 
I guess, as cool paperweights. Next, we have the head of St. Catherine, and I only put her above St. John because her life is much more crazy and really highlights the fact that we didn't know much about mental health at this point in human history. From what I can tell, St. Catherine didn't really come from an affluent noble family, but she wasn't really struggling. But from an early, early age, she was an incredibly devout Christian. I mean, it was probably the thing that she did the most. She was so Christian to the point that her family became uncomfortable with it um, and didn't really like it. But she stayed her path and stayed true, joining a convent and giving her life over to Jesus. She was also set to have an arranged marriage, again, highlighting the fact that she probably wasn't poor, at least. She did the same thing that St. Clair did. She cut her hair, but then she also fasted to make herself less appealing to this man, and it worked in this case. He left her alone. But then at the age of 21, St. Catherine had a dream. In this dream, she became married to Jesus Christ himself. Jesus Christ Superstar entered her dream and consummated their marriage, and she was given a ring of Jesus' foreskin as proof. Yes, that supposedly how Jesus proposed to her was with a ring of his foreskin, but it gets better than that, because that ring of foreskin was also invisible, and only she could see it. She also supposedly had the stigmata, which are markings on hands, feet, side that represent the sufferings and injuries that Jesus took during his crucifixion. Um, however, those were also invisible, so only she could see those as well. Most of her miracles also only really were visible to her. She supposedly sent souls to heaven, communed with Jesus, and a bunch of other things like that, um, but no one ever could see or verify these things. The main reason she was given any credit at all, I think, is because she was actually a very shockingly intelligent woman, all things considered. It really highlights that just because somebody is a little off their rocker does not mean that they are not intelligent, because her writings are incredibly influential and incredibly important to the church even now, and holds church doctrine uh, to a really high standard that most people don't hold it to anymore. But she died in her late 20s, I believe, of sickness, just general sickness, and a stroke. Now, there are theories that range from the fact that she just got sick and died, to her many fastings that she partook in made her get sick and die because she was weak and frail, likely anorexic. But then also there's the possibility, in my mind, of a brain tumor causing all these visions and then slowly shutting her body down. I have nothing to actually back this up, but this theory is about as good as any other that I've seen, so why not? But her head was removed after death. It was exhumed, um, much like everything else, because it was found to be incorrupt. And, uh, so was her thumb, actually. Not her ring finger, not the one with Jesus' foreskin on it, but her thumb. So, that's... that's good. Now we get into, uh, the full corpse category. And yes, you've heard, you heard me right. They have full corpses that they keep in reliquaries as opposed to just tombs or mausoleums, and they display them, usually only on special occasions and usually only to very specific members of the church. However, uh, some are a lot more interesting than others, and some are just there for some reason. Now keep in mind, supposedly there are about 300 saints who are incorruptible or incorrupted in some way, shape, or form, whether that's part of their body or their whole body. We're, we're, gonna, we're only going to go over about six or seven. We're, we're going to keep the list a little shorter for this. Also, I'm not really going to go over their lives here. I'm going to talk about what they're saints of and uh, what's left of them, and then we're going to move on because there's a lot. St. Vincent de Paul, who died in 1660. He's the saint of charities, horses, leprosy, and Madagascar. Saints have weird lists. Saints have weird lists of things that they're saints of. But when his body was exhumed, he was found that his bones and heart were incorruptible. And he is kept in a reliquary with a mask that is kept in the visage of his life. Then we have St. Bernadette, who died in 1879. She is the saint of bodily sickness, shepherds, people ridiculed for their faith, and she's also against poverty. St. Rita of Cassia? Cassia? Something like that. But she died in... But she died in 1457 and was totally incorrupt until about the 1700s when people moved her mask and stuff and realized that she was just a mummy. Not a living mummy. Just, like, she was mummified. She's the saint of lost and impossible causes, marital problems, abuse, and mothers. Saint John Vianney died in 1859, and he is the saint of, uh... 
but he's the saint of parish priests, confessors, and wait for it, Kansas City, baby, hell yeah, let's go Kansas City Chiefs! Woo! St. John's had a good year. But then we have probably my personal favorite, not because it's weird or anything like that, but because it's just probably a guy, just in it, just a dude, because we have St. Dacian. We know nothing about him. We know nothing about his life. We didn't know he was even a saint until apparently a wealthy Italian lady donated the corpse to the church and claimed him to be Saint Dacian. He does not have a sainthood and we don't really know what his life was. We only have theories. So at this point in time, I'm going to say that if he is the saint of anything, he is the saint of the unknowable. But yeah, the list goes on, it gets weirder, it gets stranger, and of course Christianity, Catholicism, it aren't the only ones to really engage in the veneration of the dead or the veneration of corpses. But it is very strange that we just don't talk about it whenever it comes to Catholicism. Now, I firmly believe that pretty much all religions are weird and they have their own weird customs and weird things that they do, especially when you go back to the ones that do it the most traditional way. But I'm not going to tackle that whole can of worms right now, because there's a lot. There's a lot, and I'm very uneducated in a lot of these others. I'm still pretty uneducated in Catholicism. The only fact that I can tell you, other than about the artifacts, about Catholicism, is the fact that for purposes of Lent, wombats and beavers are considered fish. So, do with that information what you will. Also, subscribe. Hey, how you doing? Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate it tremendously. You're the best person that I know personally. I have been just running myself ragged here recently. A lot of birthdays, a lot of celebrations, a lot of holidays, all back to back to back to back. And my allergies are killing me, so I apologize that it's been like a month and a half since my last video. Um, don't know what my next video is going to be. I'm not going to tie myself down because getting this one out was a chore and a half and like... I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't like making myself do things. I got new glasses. I can't wear them because the ring light fucking reflects off of them. But, you know, I got new glasses. Anyway, y'all have a great rest of your day.